Hi everyone and welcome to our last session at day five of the VID19 conference. My name is Julia Steele, I am the creator and host and I'm incredibly excited to welcome the one and the only, the fantastic <laughs> Margie Worrell from Singapore. Um, for people that don't know Margie's um, impressive history, she's the author of five best-selling books and her fifth one's just come out on her shoulder there. You've got this. I can't wait to read this one, Margie. <laughs> um, she's an international speaker and a media commentator, so you can find her thoughts in places like CNN, the Wall Street Journal, and Forbes magazine as well. So, Margie, you're going to take us on a journey with brave leadership, which I can't think of a better topic given the uh, situation most, most of us find ourselves in. So yeah. uh, I'm going to hand it over to you and we're just going to go on a wonderful journey together. So uh, enjoy. I can't wait to hear this. Well, thank you, Julia. And hello to everyone who's tuning in. It's um, what a time, what a time, right? Um, I don't know about you, but I still feel like my head is still spinning a little bit and the ground beneath us feels really shaky right now. And everything, the world as we knew it, even two weeks ago, feels like this long lost good old days. And so if you're finding yourself right now feeling a little bit ungrounded, anxious, nervous, overwhelmed, you are not alone and it's entirely natural. And of course, a lot of my work, so much of my work is around helping people live and lead more bravely. And I do a lot of work with, with organizations and helping individuals, teams um, lead more bravely. And, and at the heart of courage and brave leadership, right, is taking action in the midst of our fear. And of course, there's always a low grade level of fear. I mean, you don't have, we don't have to be in the middle of a massive seismic crisis, global crisis to be feeling fear. Fear often gets in the way of us leading ourselves and leading others to get the best possible outcome. But when we're in a time like this, just such an extraordinarily turbulent time, when the future is so mired with uncertainty and everything, everything is disrupted, fear just rises up unlike that leaves every, every other time, you know, just eating its dust. And so whatever your situation right now, I believe that right now when fear runs high, the need for courage and for brave leadership runs even higher. And so right now, actually, we all have the opportunity and an incredible um, invitation and frankly, a responsibility to really step it up in how we lead others. But in, but, and that all begins with how we lead ourselves. And so today in this session, yeah, I want to talk about how you can lead others, but I really want to also just begin with how you leading yourself, because our ability to lead others, our ability to harness the best in others, our ability to navigate uncertainty, to bring out, um, to create an environment where others can come up with more creative and innovative ideas, um, where we can do things that haven't been done before, to create the agility that's needed, particularly now, that all comes down to our ability to, to be agile in ourselves, to challenge our own best thinking and to rise above our own fears. And so I just invite you now, as you think about all of the challenges that you have on, what is it going to take for you to keep coming back to being grounded in yourself as a leader. And there's a concept, I, I wrote about it in, in You've Got This actually, it's called self-certainty. And that when the world around us is uncertain, we need to ground ourselves in, in self-certainty, that is in attitude certainty. People right now are looking, leaders are a little bit like emotional barometers. People are looking to leaders to say, how should I be dealing with this? How should I be coping? Everyone is anxious. Some people are going to be so anxious that their brains aren't going to work very well. They're, and we know that our levels of anxiety um, are, is an inverse relationship with our cognitive function. So the more anxious we are, the lower our cognitive function and it derails the quality of our decision making. It derails our ability to think through things logically and rationally. And so people are going to look to you for cues on how should I be dealing with this? And that's where it's so important. Two things, keep this in mind. To be really showing up with deliberate calm 
and unbounded optimism. And uh, there was a guy called General Stockdale. He was uh, one of the commanders in the Second World War. And in the book, Good to Great, Jim Collins talked about the Stockdale paradox. And the Stockdale paradox, it's one that actually leaders need to be embracing right now. And that is being completely upfront, transparent and honest about the facts as, as hard as they are. And at the same time, holding on to unwavering faith that you will ultimately prevail, that you will ultimately come out the other side of this. And when we're faced with something that's such a threat, like we're all feeling threatened right now. Um, our existence is feeling threatened. I know for me, I was due to head off next week on a month speaking to her around the United States. Suddenly everything was canceled. Suddenly my six months pipeline of speaking engagements, I've been bit cancelled, cancelled, cancelled. Or those that haven't cancelled yet, um, well, certainly in the next few months, they, they will. Um, they just in too much disarray to actually get around to cancelling it. And so, I know in the beginning for me, I focused in on what am I losing here? Oh my goodness. You know, this kind of like, ah, this threat. And I was like, oh, there's my income. There's my work. There's my, and then I know for me, when I got grounded in myself to go, okay, there's what is lost. They're the doors that are closing, but what is it that is opening and where, where do I actually need to step up and open doors? And what is the need right now in this moment that I can feel that I need to feel? And so for you, just getting really grounded in the core values of who you want to be as a leader. So whether that is optimistic, calm, courageous, decisive. There was a study done by Gallup um, and they studied all of the great crises over the last hundred or so years. So Pearl Harbor, Great Depression, Kennedy assassination, 9-11, 2008, global financial crisis. And the four key needs that employees are looking for in their leaders are trust. Can I trust this person that they're competent, that they're going to be able to help us navigate through this storm? Two, compassion. Do they care about me? Do they actually care about me or are they just focused on saving themselves? Three, stability. Are they able to have a steady hand here? Um, are they going to be be able to be respond versus just be reactive and hope, which I, 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 I use, I could think of that as optimism. So, you know, are they going, are they going to give me hope that we will get through this? And so as you think about who you need to be as a leader right now, ground yourself in self-certainty. Like there's a lot of things I can't control around me, but what I can control is how I show up for others. And I know, I know for me, that's something I have to do every single day. Um, and I'm not sure that some of you may be connected to me on social media. Um, and some of you may have never heard of me before. But um, last Friday, actually, my husband was diagnosed with COVID-19 and hospitalized. And he has been in hospital now for five days. And he has yet to turn the corner. And it's been um, a really um, difficult time. It has been absolutely uh, created a lot of anxiety. And I felt overwhelmed. I certainly felt overwhelmed on Friday night when he messaged to say, um, I've tested positive. And for me, I'm like, okay, uh, I, I'm a leader in my own way in the work that I do. I'm a leader as a mother. I'm a leader in, um, you know, people I know look to me. I talk about being brave all the time, you know. And right now, fear literally came up and grabbed me on the chest. And so I've had to multiple times, many times, and not just once throughout the day, to stop and engage in some really mindful breathing and double down on the practices and the rituals that will help me be grounded in who is it, who is it that I want to be in these moments that matter most. And right now in the midst of crisis, we really define who we are as leaders in how we respond in the midst of these t stormy times. It's, it's great to be optimistic when everything's going fantastic. What about when it's not? It's easy to be brave when you know, you're know you landing everything. It's easy to be decisive when you know exactly what your market or you think you know what the future is. What about when you have no idea what it's gonna look like a month from now? And so for you, I just encourage you right now, for yourself, what is it that you need to do more of? Where do you need to prioritize time in your schedule at least every day to ground yourself in those values that you want to embody right now?
and then keep coming back to it. And it's the little micro rituals, the little things we do every day. I know for me, I journal. Um, I usually exercise. Or I am kind of exercising, but I've been now put on a 14-day strict quarantine because I am considered, I'm in Singapore, an infection risk for coronavirus. So I can't go outside for 14 days. Um, so I'm just doing the little bit that I can inside the house in an apartment that I'm in. But you know, I'm like really deliberate about doing something because I know if, I, if I'm not on my game right now, and same for you, the most important thing that you need to focus on is what's the mindset you're bringing? What's the heart space you're bringing? Because that's what's gonna matter for people. Secondly, um, really important for you is to be really clear on what the mission critical is. There's a concept that's called the rally effect, that in times of crises, uh, people rally around a cause. You know, your company now, your business, and I'm not sure how many of you are in large organisations and how many of you are running smaller businesses, um, how many of you are solopreneurs, doesn't matter. What's the mission critical right now? Uh, for me, in my work last week, um, was it last week, start of last week, I have my team and we had a meeting and I said, okay, guys, you know, my pipeline of work in terms of speaking in front of groups of people, facilitating leadership programs, keynote speaking, that's, that's gone in the short term. And we don't know when that's coming back. So, okay, we need to put together an offering for virtual programs. And actually even this program and kudos to you, Julia, um, somehow it landed in my inbox, someone tagged me or something. And exactly to your point, Julia, to you to do this, that was really responsive. Right, right now in this moment, where is there a need? And so just as, you know, the fact that you're here on this now, that's meeting a need. So for you, what is the need that you need to get everybody around? What are the mission criticals? And, and what we know that leaders who lead best through, through crises, people are very clear on what the priorities are and they are in a hierarchical order. You know, this is this, these are our top priorities. This is our top five. You don't want 25 priorities. You know, in fact, if it's probably three is plenty and maybe even just one. But there's always going to be a tension between the priorities, right? It's like, do we take care of our people and try and keep us, all the employees on? Um, or do we risk losing good talent? Um, but, you know, yes, that saves money in the short term. So there's all this tension. So there's all, you're going to have to be agile as you navigate through the priorities of the moment. But I think really getting everybody on board with what is the mission critical for you right now? Is that just having a look at, okay, we need to relook at everything we're doing here in terms of our products and how we deliver them and our distribution channels, our pricing, our policies, et cetera. Um, back in January, I was back in uh, East Gippsland in Victoria. I grew up on a dairy farm up there, one of seven kids. And I was there with my family, my family, my husband and our four kids and my extended family. There's about 30 of us and we all get together. It's chaotic and crazy and fun and and of course there was the fires raging and um in the in the beginning it was like yeah they're a way away but actually in the end as the as the obviously the weather and the fires were were really burning out of control we were it was mandatory evacuation and so we packed up my parents most precious belongings um which wasn't a ton actually. It's interesting. There's not that much that's precious when it comes down to it. And um, besides life. And, um, and we got out of there. And I, it's funny, I was talking with my siblings. We all rendezvoused outside the danger zone. And my sister said, you know, gee, it's been the worst of times and it's been the best of times because as a family, we all came together. Like, let's try and protect the property. Let's make sure everyone's safe. And there was a beauty that comes from that. And so for you as a leader, you know, this is a time for building connection and building trust and building collaboration. Unlike you have in usual times where everyone's, you know, everyone's siloed and doing their own thing, it's harder. But right now, rallying people around a shared sense of purpose, that's really, really critical. The next key, key thing I think is, is to be leading from head and heart. Now, you may kind of tend to go one way or another. Some, some people are very analytical, um, you know, very logical, you know, let's, let's look at the numbers here. Let's make sure we've, you know, we're just looking at the bottom line and all the numbers. 
But right now it is actually about more than pure facts. I heard someone say recently, and I disagree with them, that you need to be just communicating the facts, nothing more than the facts at times like this. I disagree with that because I do think you need to absolutely be communicating the facts and be transparent around the facts. This is how it's looking, folks. This is what the shape of the business is. This is the impact of, you know, this pandemic and the closures and what's happening to our the state of our business. But you also need to, to put your heart and the, the impact on people. People right want now want to know that you care about their well-being. This isn't just about the bottom line of the business. This is about the state of the people in your business. And, and letting people know that you care about what they care about. I talked about uh, the, the pillars, the four key needs that um, Gallup identified, being one being trust, one being compassion. There's a little overlap with that there because one of the four pillars of trust, so trust, and I won't go deeply into these, but one, can I trust that you'll do what you say when you say you're gonna do it, reliability. Two is sincerity. Do, can I trust that you mean what you say and say what you mean? Three is competence. Can I trust that you have the competence, the skills, the resources? And the fourth is concern. Do I trust that you care about what I care about? And so when it comes down to leading from both head and heart right now, you need, you need to connect with people at their heart level. Um, be human. Um, show empathy. Show compassion. You know, there's a lot of people, if you've got a, an organisation with employees, they're going to be very worried that they're losing their job. And the, and, the, and the truth is, many, many, many will. And many are going to be very anxious. How are they going to pay for their lives, for their mortgage, etc.? And it's really important that people know that you care about that, not just keeping the ship afloat. Yes, that's important. But what about the people on that ship? And what about the people that maybe you're not going to be able to keep in your organization. And I think people want to know if you have to let people go, that it's hurting you to let those people go. I was watching a video and I recommend you look at it. I wrote a Forbes column, actually the, the post, I just posted an article to LinkedIn today, um, just a, a half an hour or so ago, but I, and I included a link in here to a speech by Arnie Sorensen. He's the CEO of Marriott. And I've done some work with Marriott over the years, and he's a really just an ex exemplary leader. And he gave a speech about four or five days ago. And to me, it is just an example of what great leadership looks like in crises. He was brutally upfront about the facts. They are closing hotels. They are laying off tens of thousands of, of family members. Marriott is run, the Marriott family run, own Marriott. And they see their employees as family. And it hurt, I know, because I've, I've met the Marriott family and I know they feel they really love their people who work for them. And it hurts them to let them go. You know, it really does. And, you know, it doesn't mean they don't have to make the tough decisions to let people go, but people know that it's not, that they're not caring for them. They just know that they have to do that in order to keep the business alive and existing into the future. So lead with head and heart. Next key thing that I think to, to move through a, a period like this is around communication. Um, there's a rule that is the 10 by 10 by 10. Mm. So you need to say something 10 ways. Um, you need to say it in, sorry, you need to say 10 times in 10 different ways and people will get about 10% of what you're saying. People hear things in different ways. Right now, a lot of people are feeling like they're drinking from a fire hose. I am. In fact, Julia will she, she won't tell you this, but just as we were about to get on, I'm like, I click the link and it's taking me to an international dial-in number. She goes, no, you're looking at the wrong email. And um, I was like, oh, okay, because I've been inundated. My inbox is just full to overflowing and I'm not processing all of the emails. I'm not processing everything as well as I, I should have, as I would in an optimal situation. A lot of people aren't processing. We're overwhelmed. And so you might, you have to use different mediums to communicate, communicate in different ways with different people. Some people, maybe it's, you know, setting up a webinar for others, you know, an email and then a memo and then this. So just be mindful of different ways of communicating, whether it's verbally, whether it's, you know, just, just use the different channels that you have available to you to get across the points, to be updating people, to be rallying people behind purpose. And of course, I think what's really important right now, when everything is so serious, 
to also be injecting some humor into things. Humanize yourself, be human, be visible, be real, um, and, and, and throw in some humor. You know, there's so many funny memes going around right now. And I mean, they're re- some of them are just so funny. I, and I, I literally sit there laughing. One today, it was a little girl and the mother's telling her she can't go to like McDonald's or anywhere she wants to go. And she's just having this tantrum, the world's over. And it just cracked me up because it reminded me of so much what my kids would have been like when they were about four if I said, you cannot go to McDonald's. Um, and so... So just, 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 just make sure in your communications, you're also being humorous and fun and it's not all hard work. Humor, we know, helps us be more resilient. Um, in those hard times, a little bit of fun can go a long way. It can just, ah, oh, it's like a little, you know, you can just breathe for a moment. You know, the sky might, we may be thinking it's going to fall in, but actually folks, it's not going to fall in. Um, and, and it just helps to just let everyone just breathe again for a minute. I think another a point in, in align with this is the importance of also recognising that even though the days are dark right now and it feels like it is the end of the world, I mean, some people that would be telling you it is the end of the world as we knew it, um, we will move through this crisis. We will come out the other side. Life will return to normal, but it will be a new normal. It won't be the same, but we will come through this storm. And that value of optimism is so important. People who are optimistic, and the research shows optimists weather life storms better and they emerge out of life storms better off. They don't avoid life storms. No one's getting out of this storm. And it's not about being Pollyanna-ish and going, oh, it's all good. You know, isn't this just all so wonderful? I see some people going, this is just all good. I'm like, no, it's not all good. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of death. It's not all good. It's, it's not good. But, but we can still be optimistic that we will get through this, that there will be good that we can find in this. Which brings me to the next point, And that is to look for the opportunity in this adversity. Napoleon Hill once said, in every adversity is, lays the seed of an equal or greater benefit. And uh, I know for me, I've had plenty of setbacks and disruptions. Actually, the, the book that I've, I'm just launching, You've Got This, has been written for me over the last couple of years in a period that's been massively disruptive. I've actually had two and a half years of huge disruption with moving around the world with my husband's family, with my kids being dispersed around the world because of international moves with his company, um, with very little notice, with being told we're going to one country, then being sent to another country. We've sent my kids ahead to the other country. You know, just, it's been messy. And I've had to navigate that. And it's not been easy. There's been plenty of times where I felt a bit overwhelmed and it's easy to get resentful or it's easy to get stuck in self-pity or it's easy to get stuck in pessimism or why me um, and why this and why now. But actually, within our challenges, within our adversities, there is always opportunity. The problem is, is the way our brains are wired with the negativity bias. We're wired to focus more on all of the bad things. We're wired to focus more on all the things that could go wrong or have gone wrong and all the things we can't do or we should be able to do and who's to blame. And, um, and it's, it's always much more fun to point the finger at other people. But actually in the midst of these storms are opportunities for us to learn things we wouldn't learn otherwise, to grow in ways we wouldn't grow otherwise, to innovate. And I firmly believe, and maybe it's the optimist in me, but I know I really believe that organisations coming out of this will do business better. I mean, even already, setting up better technology so people have more flexibility to work from home. That should just be happening anyway, but it's really happening now. And so the things organisations should have been doing, um, but they weren't because, ah, you know, cost money. Now we don't want to change. We get stuck in our ways of doing things. So there's a lot of good that can come from this. That's not to say, that's not to deny the bad. But for you, your role as a leader is to be a catalyst for transforming the adversity into opportunities for good, for learning, for innovation, for creativity, for doing things better, for re-engineering systems and processes, for coming up with better policies, 
for creating a more agile organization. Um, I'm an organization I was having conversations with today about their policies and their healthcare policies and medical policies. And they're like, no, this is our policy. And I was like, right now we're in a pandemic. What your policy is sticking rigidly to the policies that you use in ordinary times is not necessarily the smartest thing to do in times like this. So just be careful about getting stuck in rigid paradigms of past times. Uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, said in a speech to the United States Congress in 1862 in the midst of the Civil War, which was a pretty dark, stormy time, that the dogmas of the quiet past are insufficient for the stormy present. And so as this time is anew, we must think anew and act anew. And so the dogmas, our ways of thinking about how to do business two months ago, they're not going to cut it. But in there is an opportunity to find better ways of doing it and to be agile. Uh, where are we at with time? We're doing good. Okay. Because I'm going to take some questions for you and I haven't even looked at the chat, but I, I will look at it in just a moment. Um, the next key point I want to make is around decisiveness. And it is easy to get paralyzed in times like this. <gasps> what to do? And let's face it, uh, we all like certainty. We're wired for certainty. We like to think we can make decisions based on a future that we can predict with accuracy, um, or at least think that we can predict with accuracy. And so, you know, a lot of organizations have a whole planning departments and forecasting models and all well and good, all necessary. However, if you're waiting right now for certainty or even a vague sense of knowing what the future looks like before you make decisions, you're going to be waiting way too long and you are going to be missing out on opportunities for learning, for growth, for um, responding to the ever, ever, ever changing needs of your customers, the market, the, the environment around you. You're going to be holding back innovation. Um, and so right now, really important make decisions, make decisions with the best information you have. Sure, you look out, you need to stop and pause, assess, what are we looking at here? What are the different risk factors? You know, you need to play things through to the end. Okay, we need to kind of think things through. But then you need to take action and make a decision. And when it comes to brave leadership, often what gets in the way of leaders, and this is even in good times, this isn't just even in crises, um, the fear of making a wrong decision stops people making any decision, including a right decision. So Jeff Bezos says that he makes decisions based on 70% of the available information. So 70% of the available information, he's like, you know what, let's just make a call here. In other words, that's, that's saying we aren't going to make optimal decisions. It is almost 100% likely, whatever decision we make, we will adjust it, we will iterate, we will pivot, we will change. Some of them may be 180 degrees wrong, but they're making decisions and they're in action. And having worked with some pretty big mono mammoth organizations around the world over the years, the ones that I think are the biggest, um, the ones that honestly right now, it'll be interesting to see how they cope. They are so slow to make decisions. They have to do a study have to engage a, a firm, to a very expensive firm, because not, then we can at least put the blame on BCG or McKinsey or something. Let's do the study. Let's spend, you know, $100,000 or a $1 million on the study. And then let's, part, you know, move that on. And then six months or a year's gone by. And now let's do another study. And then another three studies are done. And two years later, they're like, ah, oh, well, now the market's changed. We need to do a meta study of all the studies. And because no one wants to make a decision. No leader in those organizations in that culture that is so risk averse is willing to just make a decision and say, let's go with this. They're not relying on any intuitive sense. They just want to try to take all of the risk out of it. You cannot take the risk out of your decisions, even in good times, but you certainly can't take the risk out of your decisions now. So be willing to risk a bad decision, but be willing to risk making a good decision too. And the biggest thing is, the biggest risk you take is actually taking no decision because you're too scared it's going to be the wrong one. And so you pivot. And so two key things to do all the time as you make decisions, you're going to, need to be coming together with your teams, looking at it. What are we doing? What's working? What's not working? Revisit it. Also, 
talk to people, get really create a culture environment where people can play devil's advocate, poke holes in the logic of the decision, get people to poke holes in your logic. Um, you know, one of the things um, which I'm going to get onto in a minute when it comes to creating a, a culture of courage with the psychological safety is making it safe for people to challenge your best thinking. If the people who work for you would not dare to challenge your thinking, you're not doing a good job as a leader. In fact, there's some massive, massive opportunities you're missing out on and your organization's missing out on. There's a steep hidden cost because you don't have all the best ideas and you are not on the ground and you, don't, you cannot possibly be over everything. And the best decisions are made when there is a diversity of people involved in giving input on the decisions. And when I talk diversity, I'm talking all types of diversity. Personality diversity. You don't want everyone to be compliant. Yes, people. You don't want everyone to be a disruptor. You need, a, you need different types of personalities. You need age diversity. We need cultural diversity. We need gender diversity. So creating that environment where there is diversity and then there's the inclusion that everybody feels their opinion is valued and not only valued, that it's welcomed and it's wanted. And when they speak up and challenge the best thinking, that that isn't something where they have to worry about what, how they could be penalized. Oh my God. And I've seen that happen. Um, in fact, you know, my only, my husband's a bit of a disruptive thinker and man, over the years, he, people don't like it when he challenges the, the prevailing best thinking. Um, and so for you, how can you create an environment where you are encouraging what's called loyal disruption? Everyone's behind the same cause here, but you want people to be challenging the prevailing best thinking. And if you're making decisions now, not all of them are going to be optimal, but you want people to be quickly saying, hey, this isn't working. We need to change this. We need to change that. Agility right now is the name of the game. Um, and with that, I just want to kind of circle all the way back to um, creating that culture of courage. And, you know, the culture of an organization is everything, everything. And right now is an opportunity to actually build a stronger culture. And cult organizations that have cultures where people do feel safe, where there is that psychological safety, um, are organizations that are gonna weather this storm better. But you have a role to play, an important role to play in fostering that psychological safety. And part of that is where you're putting your focus. If all you're doing is focusing on what could go wrong and how people might mess up, then you are essentially enlarging the holes in people's psychological safety net. If people are thinking, do I say it or do it? Do I speak up? Do I try it? And all you're doing is like, don't mess this up. They're, gonna, they're not going to step forward. You need to actually embolden people. You need to encourage people. And in fact, times like this, I think organizational structures, there needs to be more autonomy pushed down the ranks so that people actually are empowered with decision-making authority, where if they're out in regional markets, um, if they're in, in roles that are close to the ground on where the customer's needs are, that they're able to act with autonomy versus everything have to go up the five, six layers to get approval. Because if it's got to go five, six layers up or even three layers up or two layers up, then decision, the decisions are going to be made a lot slower. And I know even as a mother, um, for me with my kids, my model has always been entrust my children to act responsibly and do the right thing. And I have to tell you, it really works. I have four amazing kids and I've always said, I just trust you guys to do the right thing. And it'd be very disappointing if you didn't and there'd be ramifications. But when you trust people to do the right thing and say, I trust you. I know you've got this. I know you can do this. I need you to step up. I really want you to make these decisions. They, they grow bigger, they grow taller. You know, they, people want to be trusted. And it's an act of courage to trust people because you're taking a risk. Oh my God, what if they mess up here? But I encourage you to trust the people in your teams, trust people down the ranks. Don't be like, okay, everyone has to pass everything by me. This is not the time for everyone to pass everything by you. Um, and if you are a very command and control style person, that's going to work against you now. And so behavioral agility, 
that ability to um, respond in different ways. That's so important right now. And of course, individual behavioral agility, the, the lump sum of that is an organization's agility too. So for you, with, for you, what you're doing, maybe you're generally under stress, very task focused. Or maybe under stressed, you zoom right up, or maybe you withdraw, or maybe you, I don't know, know what your stress response is and just be keeping that in check. Because if you always approach your problems the same way, you won't be approaching them the best way. And so just be really careful right now that you're not too rigid in your response to the problems at hand. And yes, maybe you like to think things through deeply, thoroughly, do a very long analysis of things. Well, right now, you don't have time for that. Um, and maybe you tend to be someone just who's super intuitive and creative, okay? Right now, you also need to look at the hard numbers. So we need to, we need to be able to go a bit each way. I always think of a tennis player, the best tennis players. Think of Djokovic. It's not like he's just got a really great serve or a brilliant, you know, backhand. He's, he's brilliant at lots of different shots, right? He's just, I mean, that's anyone who's at that class. They're not just good at one thing or one way of dealing with the shot that's coming over the net. You need to be able to deal with things in lots of different ways. That's behavioral agility, but that's also what allows you to help embolden those beneath you and to entrust them and to create that safety and that culture of courage where they feel safe to reach out, to step out, to step up, to speak up, to make decisions themselves. And yeah, risk making a mistake. And of course, actually the, the term psychological safety was originally coined by a woman called Amy Edmondson, is a professor from Harvard. But it was also studied um, by Google, did a study of what, what was the characteristics of their highest performing teams. And the project was called Project Aristotle. And what they found, their highest performing teams, they weren't the ones that had all come out of the Ivy League schools, had the highest IQs. They weren't necessarily ones where everyone was best friends and they socialized on weekends, nor were they the ones where they worked the longest hours. The highest performing teams actually, what they found initially was they had the highest um, recorded errors, mistakes being recorded. And they're like, well, how could the highest performing teams be having more mistakes being reported? And what they discovered was there was so much safety, psychological safety within those teams that people were comfortable to say, hey, I tried this, it didn't work, I made a mistake. That they weren't ashamed, they didn't go, well, I'm covering that up, I'm not telling anyone. And so it's a great measure of a team's functioning and effectiveness that people actually feel safe enough to say, I messed up, I tried something, I didn't get a result. And the value of that is, is that everybody gets the learning how can we get that learning? And that's that growth mindset of it's okay not to land at first time, but there is so much value in the learning. And out the other side of this storm, um, there is going to be so much learning. And so make sure you're capturing this learning and capturing the learning so that your team, your organization, six months from now, 12 months from now, I know we, I, someone saw the other day, can we just like press fast forward and just start six months from now now? I get it, I totally get it. Um, man, I get it. <laughs> but um, we can't, we have to, the only way out is right through the heart of it, to quote, Robert, to quote Robert Frost, the only way out is through. And so how can we capture all that learning as we go through? How can we come out the other side of this better off? And I think for us as human beings, I like to use the term human becomings. We're not so much human beings as we are human becomings. We're all becoming who it is we can be. And so for you, as you think about, you know, who do I want to be in the world, you know, for the world as a leader, as someone, as a role model, um, there is so much opportunity for growth. You know, oaks, oaks plant, put their, their roots go deeper in storms. And all of us right now have to go deeper. You know, the, uh, the superficial ways of living our lives or the, the fast pace and the, the quick and easy, not going to cut it. Not going to cut it. We've got to really look inside ourselves right now for the security we seek elsewhere. We have to be grounded in ourselves. And I think at the core of 
what it really means to be a brave leader in stormy times, in any times, is to continually be challenging ourselves, continually stretching ourselves, continually daring to show up in bigger ways and in, in, in braver ways for the people around us and never getting complacent, ever, never ends. The journey never ends. Uh, I think we're all walking our own hero's journey. And right now we're all in this, um, there's just this collective vulnerability as we face this unprecedented disruption and uncertainty. But there's also this collective opportunity to learn, to grow, to do better. And frankly, to build better teams, better organizations, better society, better governments, better policies, a better world. And, uh, and so each of you have a responsibility. You have a role to play in doing that. And so I encourage you as you deal with the challenges of the days ahead um, to ground yourself, keep coming back and grounding yourself and how you show up. You know, there's, there's a place inside of all of us. It's like the fear is the waves and under the, it's not the ocean. And in, in all of us, there's this quiet, still deep waters. And we need to keep connecting into the quiet, still deep waters, the place in us that's beyond all the stuff going around outside of us. As Viktor Frankl said, when we cannot change our circumstances, we're challenged to change ourselves. And so now we have to be changing ourselves and digging deeper into ourselves and just recognizing that just as the best sailors aren't made on calm waters, the best leaders aren't made in smooth, easy market conditions. So with that, I would love to just open and have a look at questions. Um, did you want to, uh, to facilitate that, Julia? Yeah, happy to, Margie. Um, thank you so much. Every time I hear you speak, whether it's um, on webinars or, or on your videos, I'm just like, well, how do you cram so much content into your time? Wow. It's, it's absolutely... It's a, too fast. To those no. of you who feel like I was feeding you through a fire hose, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make the most of our time. No, no. It's, uh, the, the feed's full of, you know, inspiring and wonderful to watch. Rebecca said that. Um, so good, Michelle Stebbins said as well. And um, yeah, lots of things resonated. We've got a couple of questions and then I'll, I'll jump back into the chat. But um, so Paula said... Um, Sorry, Paul has asked, how can we help our executives to quit with old thinking? It's not all about cutting costs, but that seems to be old thinking. So what's the, that's the first place that most leaders go to. And that's a reality, as you said, yeah. it's the tennis, but how do we help them hit the ball both sides of the court? Yeah, I think in times like this, our, the old paradigm, the old dogma is it's either or. It's either people or it's profit. Like, you know, do we, do we, fire people and risk losing talent or do we keep people and risk losing money? And I would say actually that's a false dichotomy. They're actually two sides of the same coin. You don't have a business if you don't have people and good people. And yes, I get it. There's trade-offs. There will be trade-offs. But what is an organization if not its people? And so taking care of people lays at the heart of taking care of a profitable organization. And so short-term focus on cutting costs and uh, minimizing um, a downside to profitability has to be well and truly weighed up very, very, very carefully with the impact of people feeling like they were very dispensable. Um, and so how do you help people do that? I think just making sure um, there is such an important value on people and getting, getting to the heart of business. An organization is its people. I mean, it's the number one competitive opportunity for competitive advantage. It's also the number one threat of um, losing advantage is by not harnessing the best in people, not attracting the best people, not keeping the best people and not harnessing the best in people. And so I think just really um, highlighting that, the importance of that and the impact of trust. This is a, right now we're also, we have this, crises right now because of a crisis of trust. It began in Wuhan with people at a regional level not wanting to pass up bad information up the chain because they didn't want to look bad because they didn't, couldn't trust that that wouldn't mean they might lose their jobs. They didn't pass it on. So there was a slight delay in how it was managed in Wuhan. They got, when they got on board, kudos, they got on board, but there was still a delay. There's a lot of people say if they'd acted a week earlier, 
maybe they could have contained it. Um, but then globally, you know, um, fear is not a bad emotion. Sometimes we need to be afraid. And you could say right now that there were certain people, and I'm not even going to get into political commentary, but some people needed to be more afraid. And they weren't. They were very flippant about the threat of this virus. And now the, to the, the cost of that flippancy is just staggeringly mind-blowing. And so fear isn't good or bad. We just have to discern between legitimate fears and those that are illegitimate. And just sort of bringing that back to when it comes to decision making. Yeah, we don't want to lose money. We don't want to go out of business. Absolutely, you don't want to go out of business. But if you think that just, you know, getting rid of a whole bunch of people is going to help your business thrive into the future when you come out the other side of that, um, or treating people in without um, empathy, you know, that's, that's going to have a massive hidden tax long after. So trust here is so crucial. This is how can you act in a way that is trustworthy, that makes you truly worthy of others' trust and, um, and how you show up and deal with people, that's, that says everything. Absolutely. There's um, another great question here from Michelle who's asked, um, how do we work with the people above us on the 70%? So the 70% the, the decisions, so they get stuck in decision inertia. Sorry, say that again. I was just looking at a question. I was yeah, no, no, sorry. So my, uh, she said, uh, so this is from Michelle, said, what are your tips for influencing those above you to make decisions on the 70% and avoid getting stuck in decision inertia? Uh, look, I think um, when it comes to managing up, there's always a challenge with managing up because those who are up there, are up there they're managing up and often they're more up, upwardly focused than would be ideal, than downwardly focused. And so there's only so much you can do. The key thing I think when it comes to giving feedback is giving it in such a way that you're presenting it as this is going to help them look good. <laughs> How can you help them look good? Because when people aren't making good decisions, it's because they're operating from insecurity. Insecure leaders aren't good leaders um, because they're trying to fulfill a need for shoring up and protecting their own pride and their own patch of dirt. But they are always interested in how they can look good. So how can you present something in such a way that makes them go, oh, if this is going to make me look good, maybe they'll get on board with it. So presenting information um, and sharing and providing feedback, upward feedback in a way that, hey, I think this could be helpful to you. I think that's just one way to, you know, the what's in it for me factor. You, you're, you're leveraging the what's in it for me that taps what is it that motivates them. Maybe they're very... Um, very intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated for kudos or reputation or pride of position. Um, if you have to do that, it's unfortunate when we have leaders in that are like that, but yes, it's all also all too common. Yeah. And Moira, who's over in South Australia, she's a familiar name to me. Hi Moira. Um, do you think there is a gender differential in leadership? And if so, what does that look like? Absolutely. Well, uh, so, are there, are there differences in how women versus men lead or are we talking about just gender diversity in senior leadership roles? I'm just not quite sure what specifically. I would, I would go with the former. So yep. if you okay. take the current situation, the gender differential. So there was a conversation earlier, yep. not wanting to make it political, but the difference between Jacinta Ardern's response and the empathy in some of her messages yep. versus yep. some of the... the Male yeah, I, well, I mean, we know that those agetic qualities of leadership, those traditional masculine command and control, competitive, uh, positional power driven, uh, that they tend to be more masculine leadership traits, women naturally more communal, um, more concerned around taking care of people, more motivated by purpose when it comes to how, how our power allows us to influence and help People. I mean, women tend to be, I mean, the research shows that. Of course, it's not, that's a generalisation and it's not that men can't be like that too, aren't like that. And it's not women who are highly competitive. So, but I think that Jacinda Ardern is an outstanding example of someone who is able to be very decisive and swift in, um, in her actions, but also incredibly empathetic and tuned in to the human side of things. People get that she feels the pain of people. Um, you get that she's feeling, she's feeling that all the way through, but in the same time, and able to balance that with being very decisive and not trying to get everyone on board, 
she's willing to make calls and not everyone likes them. So being able to balance that. And of course, when it comes down to um, women being assertive and um, being decisive, we know that there's that backlash. There's that double bind. When we violate feminine gender norms, there's the risk of the backlash. You're too bossy, you're too pushy, you're too ambitious. Um, and so women do have to, we sometimes have to navigate that carefully. There's some great research that shows that when we preface what we're going to say by acknowledging that there's backlash, I recognise some people here might think I'm being bossy right now. However, I really think we need to make a decision on this. So when you acknowledge that there can be that actual gender bias, you're putting it on the table, but, but then moving forward anyway. And I think right now there's an opportunity for women. Um, obviously, I'm a huge advocate for women in leadership and I have a, a massive passion around getting more women sitting at top decision-making tables. And I truly believe that better decisions are made and that I honestly believe right now we mightn't be in the spot we are in if we had more women seated at decision-making tables um, because I think they help balance out the quality of the decision-making. Um, and so I think right now we absolutely need to see those feminine leadership. Um, that's not to say men can't exhibit them too, you know. And so, so I think we just need to see leaders who are connecting with the heart of people. I think that, you know, great leadership, that great leaders come from the heart and connect to the heart of people. Then they don't disconnect from their brains, but they're not just operating purely at an analytical, logical level. Yeah, it was really heartening. I've got some great male leaders in my network and it was great to see some of their posts this week and sharing photos of family and, and actually just taking some time to share the, the non-work yeah. side of them. It was yeah. really, really lovely to see. Um, two more questions and I'll let you go because um, I know you have a heap to get through. So um, Nadine's asked, um, what, would, what would your advice be to organisations to continue to enable their leaders to have courageous conversations? So what would you do to have conversations around performance and yeah. appropriate behaviour, lack of support? Oh, look, I think that leaders always need to role model what it is they want to see and they need to create that safety. And so key things are environments always inviting feedback, always inviting opinions, being the last one to speak and offer one, um, making it safe for others to give feedback um, and, and role modelling when they get feedback Thank you so much for sharing that. Making it so that everyone else around can see, hey, that was that behaviour was rewarded. It wasn't penalised. I think that's really important to be able to do. And of course, for leaders to just show their own vulnerability and for willing for them to be willing to be brave too. Um, you know, I I was I spoke at a women's leadership conference last year and the woman who was running the organisation. She got up after I spoke and she shared with the entire. Uh, the entire, all the attendees at this conference, how she had been too timid to do something. Actually, it was only like a week before. It was a specific example of where she had been, she had shied from having a brave conversation. And she shared that with the whole group. And I was really impressed with her owning how she, in a moment, chose mm -hmm. not to be vulnerable and not to put herself out there. And I think when we share that with others, that like we struggle with these things, it humanizes us, but also it creates that safety that makes it easier for others to go. She struggled with that, but she's owned that. And I know that she wants to role model and encourage that sort of behavior. So I think, you know, us, you know, role model the change you want to see. To me, you know, the, how, did, the, how, did, how do leaders lead one role model what you want to see? Yeah. And last question from the fabulous Joris. Um, hi, Joris. Um, how would you approach leaders when you know that they need your help, but you don't want to rub them up the wrong way? Are you in the organisation or are you a coach or from what's the, what's the context of that? I'm going to say knowing Joris, who's similar to me, so we, he runs his own, own practice as well. So I'm going to okay. assume, Joris, you mean leaders that you're working with, so clients? Yeah. So, you know, and I, I'm, I'm in that boat too. Um, and obviously it all comes down to the relationship you create, the trust you create. You know, you, if you've just met someone and giving them commentary on their uh, deficiencies as a leader, that's not going to go down so well. I think building up, building up trust with someone um, and when you build up trust over time, then you can say, hey, you know, I'm just wondering if you'd like to have a conversation. 
around, you know, how, how you're, you know, how you're going with dealing with these situations or, and just, and get them to say, yeah, no, I'd really like to do that. Or maybe they're not interested. And if they're not interested, then there's not a space to do it, but see if you can create that opening. But I think, you know, it's so important. Obviously it's all comes down to the context of your relationship with someone. Um, some people are far more receptive than others. Some are like, bring it on. Yeah. What can I do better? I really want to get better. I love, you know, I love, they're the really, they're the clients you love to have. Help me get better. Um, and then the ones that are defensive and no, nope, this is how I do it. You know, there may not be an opening in which case you've always got to ask yourself, will this serve, you know, will this serve? And if this, if your sense is someone isn't ready for it, then maybe right now, I always say the right conversation at the wrong time is the wrong conversation. So if it's not the moment, wait. And you know, right now, I will say just in the context of this situation we're dealing with, um, a lot of people are under a lot of stress, enormous stress, feeling very overwhelmed. And so just be really careful at times like this. Um, they might not be in a space where they want feedback. This mightn't be the time. They may or may not, but just you need to just, you need to just be, use your intuition on that. Yeah. And seek, um, seek permission. So I think we had a couple yeah. of conversations earlier in the, in the, um, earlier in the conference where it's easy to jump to conclusions, right? It's easy to say, oh, because we're in this sort of situation that we can just, we can see what people need because we want to serve, but that, that wanting to serve can backfire if people aren't receptive to, to, yeah. to, to, to wanting help at that time. Right. So yep, absolutely. So much love Mari in the feed for you. I will get copies of everything oh. to you. Um, Joris said perfect answer. So thank you so much. Um, if people want to follow you, your website's beautiful. It's got heaps of content on it. I know you're on Instagram and things as well. Um, if we want to follow you, what's the best place to do uh, that? Look, I would love it if you would connect with me. Sure, sure. I'm on LinkedIn. Definitely connect there. Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, I also encourage you, I've got a Live Brave podcast. You might enjoy it. I've just um, released a whole series for, for my new book, You've Got This, and you can find you order you can order that on my website too. And you know what? I wrote this to help people stay grounded in uncertainty. I had no idea I'd be releasing it in the midst of this pandemic under house quarantine in the situation I'm in. So, um, if people are looking for something to help them ride through this storm, I, I just um, I really encourage you to check that out. And um, it's in books. It's in airport bookstores around Australia, but no one's in a no one's in the airport. <laughs> Um, I'm sure, Mari, that when we do eventually get our hands on it, it will be well, absolutely worth a read, just like the rest of your books. Um, I hope everything goes well with your husband. There was lots and lots of love in, early in the chat um, to make sure that everything goes well there. And um, thank you so much for spending some of your very precious time right now with us. So, oh, my pleasure. Um, please fill the chat with appreciation for, for Margie. And um, yeah, please keep us posted on social with how things go for you yeah, and we're I here shall. for you from I australia shall. thank you all right god bless everyone see you